ABC. Local Radio. Well, on the weekend, I had a rather unusual experience. A family member who's rather mature rang me uh, to tell me that the Bank of England was printing money. And I poo-hooed this family member, even though she'd lived through the Depression and seen what a Depression was like. And as a person who's simply an, an ordinary Australian citizen, she was smart enough to know that if you have an economic financial crisis, you don't print money. After I poo-hooed her and hung up the phone and read the Australian Financial Review, I had to ring back and apologise, because it turned out... It's true. The United Kingdom, through their central bank the, uh, uh, the, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, is printing money to solve their financial problems. They've given it a different phrase at the moment. The phrase, I think, uh, is called quantitative easing. And my next guest I'll be asking to explain what that is and whether it's a weasel word. The United States is suffering deepening uh, economic problems. Unemployment is over 8% and focus is shifting to Europe, which is looking like the next centre of economic problems. On the flip side, Australia is doing OK, but with a rider on the government's decision to hand out cash. And in the meantime, Canada's not looking too bad at all. We might draw some lessons from that very shortly. But in the meantime, my guest this evening is Chris Leithner from Leithner & Company. Chris, thanks for coming in. Thanks, Steve. Tell me uh, why it is uh, that... Uh, uh, or tell me what the phrase quantitative easing means. Quantitative easing is to a great extent uh, a weasel phrase, but let me uh, explain it. It's basically, it refers to the creation by a central bank, like the Bank of England, like the Federal Reserve in Washington, of unlimited amounts of money within quotations, not real money, but funny money. Um, they're literally conjuring things out of thin air. Um, this potentially unlimited increase in the supply of money is different from what uh, central banks uh, had been doing over the past several years. They target a particular type of rate of interest. In Australia, it's called an overnight cash rate, and they have to adjust the supply of money in order to match that particular rate of interest. But once that rate of interest falls, or once they push it uh, far below uh, a market level, they basically uh, abandon that sort of a policy. They, 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 they abandon even the, the pretext um, uh, of prudence, and they basically say, gee, we're just going to print uh, as much of this stuff uh, as we possibly can. Now, why on earth would they do that? The, the underlying economic fallacy here, and I think it is a fallacy, uh, is that um, borrowing and spending will somehow uh, uh, pull countries uh, out, of, uh, out of the problems. That borrowing and spending uh, leads to prosperity. They've got it precisely backwards. They've utterly and totally forgotten that it's savings first, which leads to production. Once you produce, then you can consume. So it's, if you like, the first stage in the process is always savings. The last step, uh, if the savings is done properly, if the uh, production is done efficiently, then we have prosperity. But to short-circuit that and simply to try to uh, uh, print money and to encourage people to borrow and spend, no, that's not going to solve anything. So quantitative easing is really a weasel word. It's, it's really just a way of saying we're going to print money, but we're going to try and give it a very formal-sounding title. Uh, it's that, and in fact it's more than that. It's legalised, it's licensed counterfeiting. Now, just, just, I just might interrupt, Chris. Yep. Just forgive me, just stop right there. We've just got a problem with that microphone. Okay. I might just uh, play a little uh, message and then we'll just fix something up if that's okay. That's Bear with fine. me. If you're a parent, I don't need to tell you that your child is among the most delightful, intelligent and gifted people this planet has ever seen, destined, of course, to become Prime Minister, World Champion or Nobel Laureate. But in the meantime, it couldn't hurt to give them a head start with a gift from an ABC shop, like the Experimental Science for Kids DVD, the Wiggles Wiggle and Learn Getting Strong DVD, or even the Back to School 2 CD Value Pack. Find a gift to really get them thinking at ABC Shops and ABC Centres. The BBC Natural World Collection is now available on DVD, an award-winning series that celebrates the many wonders of nature with dramatic wildlife stories from around the globe. Six breathtaking episodes featuring otters, crocodiles and elephants, orphaned bears and the Japanese giant hornet, the largest wasp on the planet. The BBC Natural World Collection, available from ABC shops, ABC centres, retailers and online. ABC Local Radio. Hi, we've got our gremlins sorted out. If you've just tuned in, my name's Steve Austin. This is ABC Local Radio. I'm speaking with Chris Leithner from Leithner & Company. Chris, is that better now? I hope it is. Ah, it's much clearer, much ah. clearer. Now, we were talking about the, the UK phrase of quantitative easing. Mm -hmm. you, you've argued that it, this is simply uh, licensed 
counterfeiting. Now, of course, the, the, the central banks are the place that actually you know, orders the printing of money. Yep. They're trying to get themselves out of a deep financial hole. They're trying to stimulate their economy uh, and give it an impetus where people can actually start borrow, where banks will lend more money to people so that those people will spend money to start getting the economy of the United Kingdom flowing in a more free manner. Mm -hmm. Why isn't spending uh, printing money to get it out there for banks a way of doing it? Well, uh, simply put, uh, to print money puts uh, funny money uh, out there into the real world, but it doesn't produce a single additional widget or car, uh, any sort of a, uh, a good or service. Now, it may well change uh, who's buying or who's spending uh, that sort of a money, but for example, take the, um, uh, the so-called cash splash uh, in this country. People receive um, uh, a check in the post or electronically into the bank accounts. They rush off to the shops. Uh, the widget which you buy is the widget they buy which I cannot buy. The, no the total number of widgets or the goods and services which are available uh, for purchase hasn't changed one iota. It's simply given some people a leg up such that they can be first in the queue or move uh, further to the head of the queue. But the critical point is, uh, in order to extricate ourselves from our economic problems, uh, the problem is not a shortfall of what's called demand. My demand for Mercedes and for uh, expensive beachfront property and for uh, six-month overseas holidays, that's limitless. What's limited is my ability to finance that, and ultimately that comes from my willingness to, um, uh, to uh, consume less today to save up so that I can afford the car or the house or the holiday or whatever it is. Now, why would they do it? This is the Bank of England, Chris Leith. Yes. This is you know, yep. previously one of the most credible financial, inst financial institutions in the world. They yes. made their, their reputation, if you like, particularly in the last two centuries prior yes. to this one, for, being, you know, for showing great fiscal restraint. Uh, for being very conservative in their in their lending practices, you know, for knowing how to balance the books. I'm not sure I'd accept the characterization. I'd add, though, <laughs> that the Federal Reserve in the United States since about October or November of last year has done similar sorts of things. The Bank of Japan uh, at certain points uh, beginning in the early 1990s, and the most egregiously, most shockingly of all, uh, the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. Uh, so the, the precedent for this in recent memory is Japan in the 1990s? Yes. Did that work? No. And the most recent example in Africa is Zimbabwe? Which has run the, the, the economy utterly and completely into the ground. In other words, uh, well, as you'd well know, uh, as your listeners would well know, uh, extreme poverty uh, is the rule there. So the short answer to your question is no. Simply printing money does nothing. Now, why, why would they try and do it? I mean, they must know. Well, I mean, I assume it devalues the currency. Precisely. I'm, I'm right. assuming it, so what's the mistake that's being made then? The great fear, utterly and completely misplaced, uh, it is um, uh, misinterpreting or learning the wrong lessons from the 1930s and the Great Depression of the 1930s. Central bankers and politicians will say to themselves, ah, whatever we do, we mustn't let prices fall. Why? Because uh, debtors, uh, uh, for a debtor, uh, a decrease of prices uh, is, uh, is an absolute hell. Uh, say for, uh, for mortgage holders, they bought the house for the sake of argument at uh, 300 grand, the market price goes down to 200, and yet their mortgage is, uh, uh, is rock solid, it hasn't, uh, uh, hasn't gone down at all. The answer to your question is I think this is a misguided and ultimately failed attempt to prevent or to uh, mitigate uh, a decrease of prices in things like residential real estate, in things like wages, in things like uh, stock and bond prices. I return to the Japanese example, commercial real estate there. You can draw a graph. It's a jagged graph, but it's basically been falling despite all of these efforts by the Bank of Japan. It's continued to fall. In other words, natural laws of economics will have their way. They'll win out in the end, regardless of the extent to which um, uh, this, this artificial money is um, going to be printed. When I've interviewed you in the past on ABC Radio, you said that governments, I think, misunderstand the difference between uh, value and surface wealth of money, that they misunderstand that yep. because some, a $100 bill says it's a $100 bill doesn't mean it is. What, it, what that $100 bill means is that, that people who trade think it's worth a, you know, an X amount of dollars. I'm mucking that up, aren't I? That there's a difference between the face value and the actual value. Well, that's right. If at midnight tonight, let's imagine this thought experiment, that uh, the balance of your check account doubles, uh, every monetary calculation doubles. 
uh, the good news is, oh, great, you have um, twice as much, uh, the balance of your check account has doubled, your salary has doubled, but lo and behold, the bad news is uh, the price of residential real estate has doubled, so if you're trying to buy, it's just as out of reach uh, uh, tomorrow as it might be today. The prices uh, in the supermarket uh, have doubled. In other words, it avails uh, nothing, it's benefited no one, and in actual fact, uh, it, because it's deranged people's calculations, they had made calculations on the basis of these are the sorts of prices, uh, these are the sorts of of, um, uh, transactions. In other words, uh, that sort of exercise, this quantitative easing, increases uncertainty. What seemed to be a stable price, the one which I'd calculated, look, that seems to represent a decent value. Now it's been thrown out of kilter by producing more money. Um, uh, it devalues the purchasing power of the currency, and then people begin to say, well, hang on, if these blokes are going to continue to increase money, the purchasing power is X today, how much is it going to fall uh, uh, next year or the year after that? Which is another way of saying then it'll encourage people who stand towards the, the head of the queue to be the first to buy the real estate, the factories, the whatever it is. Why? Because uh, the money in their pocket, the bank balances, the actual purchasing power is going to decrease over time. If they don't do it, what are their options? If, if the Bank of England was to say, OK, look, we're not yep. just going to print money. Yep. It's a horrific option if you're a government official. You have to tell the truth to the population, that our policies over the past 25 or 30 years have been utterly misguided. The policy has been, let's encourage the increase of debt, let's encourage the increase of expenditure. Above all, let's increase the size of government. Under Margaret Thatcher, the size of government increased. Certain types of um, um, uh, handouts, benefits and whatnot to the middle class uh, to... Um, cut off these sorts of policies is basically to say, gee, when ultimately wealth has to do uh, with an ability to generate uh, a stream of income. It has not to do with a specific uh, number on a, on a balance sheet or an income statement, but it has to do with the purchasing, purchasing power of that stream of income over time. So that the person who then sees, oh, hang on, such and such is going to uh, uh, pay interest, I'm willing now to save. Why? Because uh, I'm assured that uh, the... Um, um, the jam which uh, my stream of income will buy today is going to be a bit more jam tomorrow as opposed to a devalued currency, which means why should I save today if what that stream of, say, interest payments is going to buy is going to decrease over time? I may as well rush out uh, and just spend a lot today, run down the con uh, country's capital stock. So the answer to your question is that it's a, it's a fundamental uh, change of mentality to say that it is not wealth uh, – sorry, it is not um, consumer expenditure, it is not government expenditure that makes us richer. It is ultimately individual people people who are willing to uh, discipline themselves, save a bit out of each pay packet, uh, save from uh, uh, the proceeds of their investment intelligently to invest it and see gradually, and it's, there's going to be ups and downs, there's going to be problems, there's going to be uh, miscues, but the critical point has to do with to get through to people that it is savings which will lead to consumption, uh, lead to production, and it'll be that production that finances uh, sustainable, sensible consumption. So they have to actually make things and trade them. Um, England are having this debate, Australia is having this debate. One of the consequences of that policy of spend today is basically to provide a great uh, disadvantage or to punish the making things industries and to give a gargantuan leg up to, say, the financial sector, which basically produces nothing tangible but swaps pieces of paper or entries on a computer. What would be the effect on Australia if England continues to print money? Any? Does it spread at all? Does it affect? Does it, it actually may have the effect of making our currency stronger in relation in, to the English uh, pound in, sterling? In, in, in relative terms, that's true. And I must say, uh, uh, in, in the United States, even though this policy in fits and starts um, uh, has, uh, has been implemented, uh, the uh, purchasing power in international markets of the US dollar is held firm. Why? Because um, because uh, uh, currencies internationally are backed by nothing but the alleged good credit of governments, it's basically a kind of a round robin, which is the least worst sort of a government. And when all said and done, the U.S. is regarded as uh, a lesser of many types of evils. The U.K. is not as regarded as creditworthy as the United States, but more so than um, uh, Italy, for example, more than Spain. Uh, I mean, the, the U.K. has normally been regarded, Chris, as a benchmark of sort of fiscal conservatism, hasn't it, of, of, of financial or economic risk responsibility. The creation of the Bank of England, I think it was in 1694, its basic purpose was to finance England's overseas wars. And that's a fundamental point as well. If there's any Greens listening uh, and uh, uh, people who basically and quite properly morally abhor war, uh, under a gold standard, under a proper currency, governments simply cannot finance wars. Why? Because they'd have to come clean to the people and say, oh, if we want to invade country X, it's in effect going to cost you a marginal tax rate of 75%. <laughs> people would quite literally burst out into laughter and say, this is patently absurd. 
absurd that you propose to do. Whereas under a central banking system, you can basically foist those debts upon your children. You can debase the currency in such a way that people can't see it from, uh, from day to day. So when you say the Bank of England has always been associated with fiscal prudence and conservatism, gee, I, I, I'll, I'll you disagree. Myself and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be very skeptical. I, I resist uh, the acceptance of that proposition. My producer has reminded me that in the late 1990s here in Australia, Pauline Hanson was lampooned for suggesting that we could print more money. W would Kevin Rudd uh, or Wayne Swan, the treasurer, be lampooned if they followed Britain and suggested the same thing of printing money to inject to inject cash into our national economy? I very much doubt it for the simple reason that... Relatively, they wouldn't be lampooned? No, for the simple reason that as we speak, uh, Merv King, who is the governor of the Bank of England, is not being lampooned particularly when he says that, oh, this policy, I can't tell you when it's going to work, but eventually it is going to work. Uh, people these days give enormous, and I think misguided, trust and confidence uh, to, um, to government officials, central bankers. Central bankers are regarded much uh, in the way that uh, the Wizard of Oz was before Dorothy... Uh, and the lion and the tin man and so on turned up and saw this madman sort of uh, pulling uh, leaves and so on behind the curtain. Once the curtain had been removed, once people realize that these are basically uh, conjuring tricks, that they have nothing to do with the creation of savings and thereby production and wealth, then people quite properly, I think, uh, will be more than upset. They'll be as outraged as you were when you telephoned on Saturday to, um, uh, uh, to broach this sort of issue and say uh, a sound currency – uh, and a government are two things which which uh, simply cannot mix. And somewhere it has to be paid back. Um, typically the way it's been paid back, in a sense, is to roll over, create even more debts, and thereby defer, create more problems down, uh, down the track at some stage. The trouble, though, is that um, our chickens, whether it's in this country, more so in England, more so in America, in Europe, you name it, around the world, uh, the tomorrow has come back, uh, the chickens have come home to roost. Uh, we're trying, or I should say central bankers, governments are trying mightily to keep the old engine going, um, uh, that's uh, more and more difficult. Uh, they're putting pressure on banks to, to lend, but bankers quite rightly are saying, hang on, we've already made lots of uh, bad loans. We're trying now desperately to claw them back, and you blokes now are yelling at us to make more loans. So we're being pressured in both senses. In one respect, indeed, uh, it is absurd. You can have the one, you can't have the other, but you can't have banks both simultaneously clawing back what they think quite rightly may well be um, uh, dud loans, and then extending more loans to people who are already uh, who've already uh, borrowed too much. They're just increasing their risk. That's correct. And endangering their good deposit holders. Uh, well, that's right. Ultimately, the people who pay, when a currency is debased, who suffers? Basically, creditors and savers, those who have done the right thing, who've led disciplined lives, who've been prudent, who've been cautious and conservative over the decades, that mentality of the 1930s, that is trashed. Why? Because as they, they see in a limited way, in an extreme way, was seen, say, in, in Weimar, Germany, uh, in the late 19, oh, sorry, early 1920s, that uh, the purchasing power of savings simply disappears. Who wins out of all of this? Debtors. Why? Because uh, their, 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 their debts are inflated away, which was a, a mortgage of $200,000. If the purchasing power of the, of, the, of the currency disappears, then they cheer hooray if it's inflated away. So politicians who are extremely astute in, in one particular way say, hang on, the majority of Australians by and large are debtors to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, we're constantly trying to sniff out uh, where the votes lie. And ultimately, the coalition of debt, the coalition of inflation, the coalition of profligacy is going to triumph over the coalition of prudence, of savings, uh, and of caution. Chris Leithner is my guest. He's from Leithner & Company. This is ABC Local Radio. My name's Steve Austin. It's seven minutes to eight. I think w um, your point's been made quite strongly on that issue, Chris, and I might just ask you one other, uh, if I may, about the other side of the planet, yep. and that's uh, or over the Atlantic, yep. in Canada. Yep. The United States President Barack Obama made a visit to Canada and it was sort of looked at in the most amusing way by most reports, but he did yep. something very serious there. He went and looked at what the Canadian banking system was doing. Yes. Largely because, as I understand it, the banking system in Canada is very strong and very healthy and they haven't made the mistakes that everyone else has made. Just in brief, what have they done right? And apparently even their superannuation uh, system is looking very strong and healthy. Yep. What have they done right that the rest of the world did not do right? Not so much what Canadians have done correctly or what Canadian bankers have done correctly, but things, th things that they have not done. What have they not done? They have not uh, encouraged residential real estate to rise to levels as it did in the Irish Republic or in England 
or in uh, the US or indeed in Australia and New Zealand. So, so they only lent to people who could pay the money back for home loans? Uh, that's a part of it. And I get the, the critical point I'm getting at is that with the exception of what's called the lower mainland of British Columbia, basically metropolitan Vancouver, a typical Canadian house will cost something like 2.5 times uh, an average Canadian family's income. Compare that to, in parts of Australia, seven times. What I'm getting at is because uh, uh, the answer to your question has to do with um, real estate prices, which have not gone well out of whack. What that will mean, I suspect, is that there will not be uh, a wave of, um, uh, of um, uh, mortgage, uh, defaults. People, uh, mortgage defaults, uh, arrears, uh, and so on, uh, with the one exception, potentially, of, um, uh, of metropolitan Vancouver. Because of that absence, there's not going to be the, uh, the issue of Canadian banks having suddenly to write off a big amount. Now, there have been some write-offs, and I'm not uh, minimizing that. Uh, but the answer to the question is, because... Uh, residential real estate did not rise to fantastical levels as it did elsewhere. Uh, banks kept relatively uh, cautious. What's called the reserve ratio is relatively higher there. I'm simplifying drastically. The amount kept in reserve in vaults rather than being lent out to businesses. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, they actually had so cash on. reserves to meet their obligations at a much higher level. Well, any bank under banking legislation, whether it's in this country or elsewhere, in effect is bankrupt. If everyone who has a checking balance decides they want to convert it into cash tomorrow, no Australian bank, is going to, no British bank, no Canadian bank is going to be able to do that. Why? Because reserve ratios are typically on the order of 10% or so. Canadian Ten percent ratio... of their actual loans or debts? Uh, in very mm. rough terms, that's right. Okay. Right. In Canada, the reserve ratio is a bit higher, which basically means the amount of loans pyramided on top of that has been less given the size of Canadian banks than it has been in this country, in the UK, Ireland, uh, and it's, uh, et cetera. So the, the basic point, they haven't had a real estate boom nearly to the same extent as in the UK and Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, and the US. Absence of the boom will be um, uh, a much less mild, uh, a, a much milder bust, basically. Okay. So what can we learn from them? What can Australia learn from Canada? That's a tough one because one of the reasons uh, – take – uh, a place or is it too late to learn it? Well, uh, that's a, a, a tough, a, a place dear to my heart called Winnipeg in Manitoba gets to minus 40 degrees Celsius. Dare I say, that's, uh, in the winter, that's one reason why real estate prices there have not risen to the same extent they have on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, it attracts people who are very tough, who are uh, doer of disposition, Scots of background, and not the sort of folks who want to put up their feet on the beach. Uh, the competition for beachside places is such that it's innately going to, um, to push up prices. But getting back to your question in a serious point, uh, increasing reserve ratios will have something to do it. That's not the same thing as regulating banks. It's encouraging um, bankers to return to practices which they voluntarily followed uh, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. So to give one example in Canada, the typical mortgage uh, in Canada, basically the uh, deposit was on the order of uh, 40 to 50 percent of the uh, the total purchase price of the house, and the term of the mortgage... The was typical on, mortgage paid half the price. That's right. In other the, words, the deposit was yep. on the order of you know, 40 to 50 percent, and the expectation was one would repay that remaining half within about five to seven years. Uh, auto loans were much less uh, prevalent, uh, and the payback, uh, to, again, a high deposit um, uh, as, as a percentage of loan, uh, a quick payback period. So it's, it's difficult then, for, or more difficult for prices to, um, uh, to get way out of whack under those sorts of circumstances. On the other hand, um, uh, given a lower reserve ratio, given a, a culture that's basically, ah, I want X, I can easily get a loan for it. Once you've got the loan, once you've got the fistful of dollars in your pocket, well, the price paid um, is really of little consequence. Why? Because if it gets $20,000 um, out of reach, you knock on your friendly banker's door and miraculously another $20,000 uh, will appear on the loan statement to enable you to, to borrow uh, even more until things go into reverse and the bank knocks uh, or the banker knocks on your door and say, oh, by the way, that um, uh, renegotiation that you wanted to start, the answer is no. And by the way, you know, we're, uh, we're calling in your loans uh, uh, and we don't much care if you have extraordinary difficulty paying things back. Um, but the answer to your question, I, I think, has to do with uh, uh, remembering our own history, that um, uh, loans were – well, put it – I'll, I'll go as far to say in the 1970s in this country, there are people who are, who are listening right now who literally had – well, I shouldn't say literally because they didn't, but figuratively had to crawl over barbed wire to get a mortgage. Mortgages were rationed, there were queues and so on. One had to demonstrate, one had to document uh, until the cows came home that one was uh, a Out of yep. mm -hmm. uh, Whereas these days, or uh, up until, say, 18 months or so ago, um, uh, allegedly more attractive offers were uh, pushed into uh, to, uh, letterboxes and so on, and the, um, the incentives were the polar opposite. People were encouraged to, uh, to borrow as much as possible, which is the, the polar opposite of what existed uh, uh, a generation ago.
Um, ultimately, if you like, the, the shovel-ready stimulus, as our dear friend uh, Obama might call it, what's the best shovel-ready stimulus? Uh, prices which are falling, uh, which put the fear of God into people, which uh, make them realize, goodness me, if I borrow today and um, the price of what I'm borrowing to buy falls, I'm going to run into real difficulty. I need to think twice. I need to think three times uh, before I actually take out the loan. So the picture I'm getting uh, from you about at least the UK and the US at least, is they're doing the very worst things possible to solve their problems. That's my fear. Uh, and I suspect people in, financial, people in financial markets are beginning um, uh, to, uh, uh, to recognize that. Timothy Geithner, the, uh, the new uh, Treasury Secretary, on the day of his, the announcement of his um, appointment, uh, the market shot up. After his first press conference, the market collapsed, and, or I shouldn't say collapsed, but fell uh, quite heavily. I'm going to have to leave it there, Chris. Yep. Thank you very much for coming in once again. Great pleasure. Chris Leithner is with Leithner & Company. This is ABC Local Radio. Stand by for the news at 8 o'clock.